Hello, hello, welcome to everyone who's joining us. So before we begin the discussion, I would just like to share a couple of housekeeping points. So today we have interpretation into French and Spanish available. To listen in your preferred language, just click on your language at the bottom of your screen and select the language you wish to hear. You can also change the language of the interface at the top of your screen. We invite you to ask questions to our panelists at any time during the event. Please use the ask a question space on the right of your screen. The panelists will answer these questions after the main discussion. You are free to use the general chat box to communicate to all participants, but please note we may miss any questions if they are not submitted via the ask a question function. Anything shared in the general and ask a question spaces can be machine translated into your selected language. Hover your cursor over the text to see an option to translate it. Please keep in mind this is a public session. Please be courteous and remain on topic. Anyone being rude or sharing inappropriate content will be removed from this event. Please only click on links shared by participants you trust. We will also be sharing some polls during this event. All answers will be anonymous. To vote, click on the chart symbol to the left of the main speaker. Ah, this way. <laughs> to go back to viewing chat windows, click on the speech bubble. If you are having any technical different difficulties, sorry, you can click on the question mark on the bottom left of your screen to contact tech support. Click the ring above the question mark to consult the voice boxer tutorial at any time. Please be aware that we are recording this event and we will share it on our YouTube channel and website. So now as the communications officer for the Partnership for Economic Policy, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our moderator for today. Bakar Ahmed is the Joint Executive Director for the Sustainable Development Policy Institute in Pakistan and a PEP Research Fellow. I hand over to you, Raka. Thank you, uh, Jenny, uh, for this introduction. Uh, and I'm really honored uh, to be here with this very esteemed uh, panel. So let me first of all start by thanking them and colleagues who have joined us uh, online, uh, not only for taking time out, but also contributing uh, to this very important subject matter. Uh, which we are aiming to discuss today. Just by way of introduction, uh, for those who will be watching online and for those who will be watching the recording later, uh, let me just more formally say that this is a group of uh, PEP research fellows whom you will be hearing from today. Uh, they have conducted uh, very comprehensive, in-depth uh, studies on the participation of the Global South in development activities, by development activities, today we take a very broad definition, which includes academic research, publishing, conference participation, consulting, participation at UN and global governance forums, and the likes. Uh, the, the, the studies and the findings uh, provide evidence that researchers from the global north conduct the bulk of research on development and development policies in the South. Uh, the Global North also has far more visibility when it comes to dissemination and outreach around the development research which is conducted today. And we'll be hearing more on this uh, from our fellow uh, uh, panelists. Uh, we also believe that researchers originating uh, from and living in the country or region of analysis are essential for advising the best policies and interventions to achieve significant improvements in people's lives in the developing world. 
And this is in line with uh, Agenda 2030, which also advocates that such measures bring greater ownership and institutional memory around the reforms which are being collectively thought and worked upon. So today, in, uh, with, with help of uh, this very esteemed panel, we are launching a public call to action to increase the participation of uh, Southern researchers in economic development research debates. Through our research, uh, we have identified areas and actors where action is most needed to redress the north-south imbalance in the development field. Uh, again, uh, of course, uh, uh, colleagues at PEP have defined the canvas of the vast development field, and we aim to include here uh, how the development research agenda is set, participation in development journals, participation in research networks, uh, development conferences, uh, research funders, and of course, funding committees are all those examples which PEP researchers have studied, and you'll get to hear more about that. Uh, during the next uh, few minutes, we will share the specific actions that we are calling for, uh, and also explaining the reasons uh, why that is so. And the way we have sort of uh, arranged the format for today is that we will have five very specific uh, interventions by my colleagues following the same uh, uh, sequence, which is on research agenda, uh, development journals, uh, research networks, development conferences, and research funding. And uh, without uh, ado, uh, let me uh, now start with our first speaker uh, for today, which is uh, uh, Professor Lucas uh, Ron Coney, uh, he's professor at uh, Buenos Aires uh, University, Argentina. It's really an honor uh, to, to listen from him. And uh, uh, before I hand over to Lucas, just in terms of uh, time management, I'll be requesting uh, the panel for initial five minutes of interventions so that we have comfortable time and we can come back to you for the Q&A. And we are hoping to have a very interactive uh, session today. So over to you, uh, Lucas, on research agenda. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Bakar. It is a pleasure to be participating in this panel. We think that researchers living in low and middle income country have too little voice in defining the research agenda of the very young countries. So what do we mean by too little voice? Well, when you, when you analyze who is publishing in development economics journals, who is participating in development economics conferences, who is writing the flagship reports of UN agencies, you basically find that between 10 to 20 percent of the authors are living in the low in low and middle income countries. My colleagues will get into the details about this, but this is what we mean by too little. Now, uh, why should we care about this? Why is this a problem? Well, we think that if you ignore the voice of local researchers, then your research and the policy recommendations that emerge from your research are unlikely, very unlikely, to take into account the local context. And we have experience. Experience tells us that the one-size-fits-all theory does a very poor job in the field of development economics. The Washington Consensus is, is one recent example. We know that the same policy has different impact in different, in different countries. So we need to take this into account. So let me, let me conclude by making some specific suggestions about the research agenda. As researchers, we know that there is a trade-off between the complexity, the importance of the subject, 
and the quality of the execution, the quality of the answer we provide. We think that sometimes we are choosing topics where we can provide a very high quality answer, but perhaps the topic is not that relevant. We think that if we give local researchers, people who live in low and middle income countries, they have a lot to say about which, to which topics and subjects are important. They live there. Simply because the quality of data for a certain country is not good enough, that is not a good reason to simply not study those countries. So we think that if there, is a, if, if there is a subject that is important that will make a difference in the quality of life of people living in developing countries, that, that, that topic should be tackled, even if the evidence we are able to provide is only descriptive. So thank you very much, Fakar. a very you have pointed towards a very important uh, point that if only 10 percent of uh, the south is represented in research and data setting uh, you essentially miss out on the local context and your other point uh, is also very important that of course the southern involvement uh, really helps you better validate uh, whatever evidence uh, and data you have uh, out there uh, so, 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 thank you for this intervention, and I think uh, there will be uh, uh, colleagues who will uh, pick up on this during the Q and A uh, session as well. Now, on uh, the sudden participation in the development journals, uh, let me turn to my colleague, uh, uh, Professor Anna Lucia Kasov. Uh, she's professor at University of Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. Uh, it's over to you, Anna. Thank you, Vakar. Thank you all. Uh, and special thank you to PEP to launch this very important event. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, publications in journals. And uh, we carried out uh, a research where we looked at the Elsevier Scopus database to find the share of researchers affiliated to institutions in Southern countries that published in the top 20 development journals from 1990 to 2019. We observed that 16% only of the articles published in these journals were by Southern scholars, while 73% were by Northern scholars. The other 11% were uh, co-authorship. The underrepresentation of Southern scholars in research on development in the South might possibly be attributed to deficiencies in research skills, English language proficiency, scientific networks, and access to technology, research funding, and travel grants. For example, it's well known that to reach a larger international community and influence the world of science, researchers need to write their studies in English. The likelihood of papers being rejected for publication increased due to the fact that non-native English speakers face more difficulties in writing scientific papers, in incurring to linguistic error and in deviating from research style. Also, in many scientific institutions in developing countries, there is lack of economic funding to journal subscription and submission fees, which are crucial to publication success. In our research, we were also able to observe that Southern scholars represented a large percentage of all submissions in the journal. To be more precise, in the review of development economics journals, 60% of all submissions were from Southern scholars. However, Southern researchers had a much higher desk rejection, 
which means the paper were not even reviewed. The reasons for these rejections were not the good fit for the journal, poor quality, introduction or abstract, paper too country specific for an international journal, focus on methodology rather than an economic question, and paper's contribution unclear. Also, for the review of the Bellum Economic Journal, papers from the South were more likely to be rejected for plagiarism than those from the North. Some authors point out that if non-native English speakers have greater difficulty in paraphrasing others' research, they run a greater risk of being accused of plagiarism. It is clear that the richness of academic dialogues is inhibited when Southern researchers are excluded. The dominance of Northern scholars in a field of research where Southern scholars have the advantage of first-hand knowledge is harmful, as those research are directly linked to development policies in low- and middle-income countries. Based on that, we are calling for those actions. Development journals need to recognize the value and contribution of local expertise and should seek to increase the participation of authors and referees from the South, as well as to increase their participation on the editorial boards of development journals. Also, development journals should not request submission fees for developing country researchers and significantly reduce subscription fees for researchers and research institutions in low-income countries. Some authors defended the creation of a network of libraries to purchase scientific journals and books jointly, noting that the practice was well established in developed countries, but was still not common in universities and research institutions in developing countries. In the same line, writing courses and exchange programs should be provided to non-native English-speaking scholars. This will help remove the financial barriers to publication. Thank you very much. These inputs, very insightful uh, ideas and uh, great research. 73% uh, is a big number uh, not to be uh, noticed, of course. And Southern researchers had higher desk rejection, as you have uh, tried to explain. Uh, I think that is something which, uh, which, which, which has really prevented uh, the Southern voice to really uh, reach the academia, wider academia, but uh, more so, of course, in, in, in development research. And uh, I think your research rightly has also called for a dialogue with colleagues who manage uh, the, 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 the development journals, particularly the international development journals that go beyond national boundaries. And uh, a submission fee, as you rightly pointed out, uh, of course, acts as a barrier to entry in uh, the provincial, in, in the pro uh, professional research space, as you rightly pointed out, for rationalizing this or even waiving this uh, for the southern uh, researchers. Uh, so, so, so thank you very much, and we'll come back to you. Uh, with this, let me now turn to uh, my colleague, Professor uh, Veronica. Uh, Amarante uh, to talk about uh, participation of uh, Southern researchers in research networks. Uh, uh, she's professor at Institute of Economics, University of the Republic, Uruguay. Over to you, Veronica. Okay, thank you very much, Baka, and thank you, uh, Pep, for organizing this, 
this event. Um, uh, in our research, we also uh, we also find that uh, research networks are crucial for for thousand researchers. And the first thing that uh, we should uh, clarify is that uh, we are understanding uh, research networks in a in a loosely way as the collaboration between researchers, and this may take different institutional forms because it may be only based. A research network may only be based on personal uh, contacts built through the academic trajectory of a researcher, or it may take the form of a formal organization, as is the case, for example, of PEP, uh, which uh, connect academics working on similar topics. And the type of connections that develop in each case and the, the potential actions that each of us can take from these two different sides are, are different, and I will return to that point later. But uh, why we um, why we insist in the in the idea that research networks are very relevant uh, to discuss this topic? First of all, uh, because they allow better knowledge creation through the combination of different academic profiles and expertise. Uh, they give access to critical knowledge and practice that are tacit and derived from collective experience, and they may be directly uh, linked to to the um, to the process of publication. As Anna was saying, uh, this is one one aspect uh, related to the to this role for for the networks. They permit access to more resources or even richer data. And uh, a network allows also a convenient division of labor among among collaborators, and so it may lead to more efficiency in the process of, of research. Um, these networks act as a motivation um, for researchers by overcoming the intellectual isolations, which may be uh, a problem in very in in very small academic communities, and this uh, is. Uh, takes place more often in developing countries. Uh, all these reasons then uh, lead us to, to think about the importance of research networks from the point of view uh, uh, of researchers from developed countries. We think that research networks may uh, give access to specific um, scientific and contextual knowledge, which is essential for the quality of research, as Lucas was uh, previously emphasizing. And also to well as, uh, to the access to, for example, uh, richer data or novel data, original data. What does the evidence uh, tell us about the role of, of research networks? In general terms, uh, for all disciplines and also for economics, there is evidence that the the integration of research networks and even more the, inter the integration of international research networks. Uh, uh, increases the quality of research. And here there is a debatable topic about what we understand by the quality of research. But uh, if we, if we, for example, look at the most common uh, indicators of the, the mainstream form of evaluation of, of the quality of research, which is the publication and and the, the journals where and the citation the journals where the work is, is published and the citations, there is evidence that this is linked to the to the belonging of uh, to research network. There are reputation channels also that reinforce this link between collaboration and methods of research performance, uh, and this can uh, can be very significant in developing countries and for southern researchers as these international networks may facilitate the, the entrance to North academic audiences. There is clear evidence that co-author papers are more often cited, and also that uh, papers co-authored by, uh, by authors from different countries also are more often cited. So we have a picture that uh, if, we, if we proxy or if we look, if we think of the quality of research at this, this, the final output and where it's published, it's uh, associated to this network. So uh, we we need to uh, the, we need to ensure in some way the access uh, to research um, 
and, and make the, the field of development studies more representative, more uh, geographically diverse, and this we think will help to, to improve the quality of our research. There is also, as, uh, as it was previously said, an instrumental reason, local researchers uh, are the ones who know the local context better and that then are more likely to, to carry out what we would call valid research or, or, or research that is really connected to the, to the knowledge gaps in, the, in, the, in a specific country or in a specific context. And uh, also uh, local researchers are more likely to have a, a positive income income on the definition of policies because they are closer to the institutions and to the people who are uh, decided on those uh, on those policies. Anna uh, already uh, went through the through their obstacles that South researchers uh, face uh, and they are the same obstacles that they face to to integrate research networks and uh, we may call about the importance of conference that will be analyzed uh, in the following uh, intervention, the problem with language that again is a it's a very important barrier and it, it, we should uh, keep that in mind because it's really an important barrier from from res from southern researchers. The problem of resources in in any way that we may think, and also uh, well probably the research skills that also we 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 are aware that human capital accumulation is lower in uh, or maybe lower in some developing countries and also uh, the academic environments are weaker uh, because resources are lower because uh, academic um, academic spaces are smaller so we have there uh, a weaker environment what actions can we can we take what can we done to increase also research partnership First, we, be, we really need to build more bridge and partnership that leverage the best of both worlds. So combine Southern researchers' understanding of the local context with the critical uh, distance that Northern researchers they bring to analyze uh, those local problems. Uh, we need to open opportunities with clear rules, and this is important, clear rules that have to do with uh, the arrangements regarding the ownership of data, the intellectual leadership, the management of research budgets. There are a lot of, of important aspects involved there and that should be uh, established in this, in this fair research networks. Uh, we need uh, pathways that, um, that help to build these networks for example, co-appointments, visiting professorships and fellowships. So there is a, a role for Northern research institutions to seek to, to expand their networks, their academic networks, and to integrate Southern researchers. Uh, we as economists are, are very aware of the dangers of power asymmetries and the virtues of greater transparency, open dialogue, and plurality and diversity in the economic discussion. So, uh, in that sense, Northern uh, development researchers should try to, to, to read and cite more work by researchers who live and work in, the, in, in Southern countries. And finally, a, a final po a point that I would like to make is that we are aware that there may be uh, some risks in this kind of, of, of associations. Uh, for example, uh, one is the, that the, that the international research agendas may lead may may end up leading this this uh, these associations and so uh, this may somehow weaken the uh, the interest of southern researchers those are things to keep in mind but we are uh, we are calling here thank you uh, uh, veronica appreciate uh, these inputs I think some very important uh, action points here, including what you explained about having very clear rules with regards to ownership of evidence uh, and data. And I think uh, one of the things which has come out uh, in the evaluation by IDRC for their uh, think tank initiative TTI program uh, was that, of course, IDRC had been supporting uh, many uh, research networks uh, across the globe. Uh, 
And one of the key findings was that organic growth of networks, uh, wherever it happened, uh, largely was a function of predominant uh, Southern uh, uh, participation in those networks, which continued for over a decade. Uh, and that's, that's how long it took for those networks uh, who have continued to survive, maybe at a national level or at a regional level, and maybe at a global level as well. Uh, uh, you also pointed out towards integration of international research networks and the fact that, of course, there aren't many, and of course, they need to pool in uh, their combined uh, capabilities uh, going forward. And the lack of connection to scientific uh, community, something which uh, many of the Southern researchers continue to face. And uh, I do understand that one of the papers that PEP has come out with uh, distinctly talks about those researchers who have produced their decent uh, dis dissertations, PhD dissertations in the South and didn't have a chance to go abroad to do those PhDs, remain at a disadvantage throughout their career just due to that lack of connection to international scientific communities uh, that they might have got had they traveled uh, abroad. So that natural disadvantage is, is something that, that one needs to uh, speak about. Uh, let me uh, quickly now turn to uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, which is uh, Professor Renal Berger. Uh, uh, she'll talk about the participation, uh, Southern participation in development conferences. Uh, she's professor at uh, Stellenbosch University, South Africa. Uh, Renal, over to you. The first question that we ask ourselves is, I guess, why do regional representation at conferences matter? Why do we think that conferences matter for development? And um, one of the most important points is that um, frequent access to conferences constitute a very important advantage to researchers and can also influence their career trajectories. Um, we acknowledge that um, conferences can provide researchers with opportunities for building networks and establishing new collaborations. Um, conferences can help uh, researchers promote their work and promote their own brand. Uh, conferences can also be a, a forum or a platform where researchers can receive expert peer uh, feedback on their early findings, which can help them strengthen their work. And um, lastly, it's also a place to learn more about new developments and methods and theory and keep abreast of what's happening in your field. And in this way, um, conference representation and specifically inequitable conference representation can reinforce existing skew patterns of resource allocation in resource funds and opportunities, which will then be reflected in research activities and research outputs. Um, but there are also more dimensions to why we uh, care about conferences. We care about conferences because they help to shape the ideas and priorities about development policy. Um, the interactive um, and formative dialogue platforms, which have a very strong normative role in shaping how we think about new findings and ideas, deciding how we will frame new work, and also, importantly, to set our research priorities and development priorities. And more generally, conferences require decisions about who is part of the conversation and who is not part of the conversation about development research and policy debates. And therefore, diversity and fair representation are vital, both as a means to end because it enables critical engagement for researchers who have a deeper knowledge of the social and um, political context, and this would enable better policy making, as my colleagues have, have argued, but also inherently, and I think that's an important point, um, fair representation is the right thing because those who are most directly affected by these policies have an additional and stronger claim to be part of such conversations. And therefore, it's crucial that developing country researchers deserve to have a strong voice in dialogues about their own region's development and their own region's future. As a side note, uh, it's important to note that um, ge geographical location and access to resources have a, a correlation, and we know that, we acknowledge that. Development conferences are interesting to consider specifically because at least pre-COVID-19, but 
also, uh, I think post COVID-19, uh, if, if that, um, <laughs> if that does, um, happen soon, um, conferences require us to gather in one venue. Um, it, it has a locational dimension and that locational and geographical dimension really matters because it affects the cost of access. Um, uh, so the choice of venues and the choice of location have political uh, gravitas because they introduce asymmetries in the time and financial cost of conference attendance, which is then further accentuated by the asymmetry in visa requirements for travel. Um, as you know, in most southern um, uh, countries, you would require a visa if you needed to travel to uh, many of these northern development conferences. So what do we think? What is needed? What are we calling for? What action is required? Um, shortly, what we have asked is the development conference and webinar organizers should include um, researchers based in these countries. They should do this, this in an improved way, give better access to, to um, researchers from the South. And the aim of that is that these researchers can better represent those uh, citizens from these countries. Um, in more, more detail, what we are asking for is that organizers and funders need to think carefully about the location and accessibility of their conferences, because it, it does matter. And um, as a last point, uh, we can also think about using virtual tools more effectively now that COVID-19 has made us all more comfortable and better acquainted with these tools, um, because they can be used to, to um, improve and increase the participation of Southern researchers. Um, why are we saying that? Why are we saying that there's a need for change and that at the moment conference representation is not equitable? What evidence do we have for this? Well, um, when we started with this work, we examined the representation of Southern re researchers at development conferences aimed to um, uh, aim to gather individuals who are working on the topic of development. We focused on five presti prestigious international development conferences that were widely regarded as the top five. Firstly, the World Bank's annual bank conference on development economics, the African Development Bank's African Economic Conference, the Center for the Study of African Economies, African Development Conference, the Bureau for Research and Economic Analysis of Development Conference, more popularly known as BREAD, and then lastly, the Northeastern University's Development Consortium Conference. So we scraped these five conference websites for the past five years um, and gathered information on the listed presenters and their affiliations. Uh, what we find is this graph that you'll see in the corner uh, that very clearly shows a very um, vast discrepancy in representation of regions. We find that six out of the 10 presenters at the top five development conferences were from developed country universities, while only one out of the 10 were from developing country universities. The remainder uh, uh, of representatives were from, not from universities, but from think tanks or multilateral organizations. But it's important to stress that also amongst this group, less than 10% were affiliated with developing country institutions. Um, Thank you. Ronal, uh, some very important points over here, and uh, thank you for presenting them in a very uh, articulate manner. I think your point around uh, uh, feedback on early findings, which is something what development conferences provide an opportunity for, is extremely uh, important. And I think uh, in COVID times, we have seen that those in-person uh, uh, interactions uh, may not be a good substitute, uh, cannot be substituted by uh, whatever, of course, uh, the, the development community has been trying to do online to pivot and really find out alternate ways as best as we can. Uh, those those in-person interactions have a capacity building element, uh, which is very important for uh, the South. Uh, uh, I think uh, you also pointed out towards a very important point, which is uh, on the transactions cost uh, of participation in development conferences. And this is something which is huge for development, uh, uh, developing country uh, researchers, 
we have seen that this uh, acts as a barrier for many of them uh, to really even submit their papers uh, uh, and, and then, of course, go through all that travel procedures, which, for example, a northern researcher may not have to do, uh, go through, including visas, corrector certificates, and other formalities. Uh, and, and your point on uh, organizers and funders who need to consider location is, is uh, equally important. Uh, you also talked about virtual tools. Uh, and if I may add that uh, while we take it as granted that these virtual tools are available for Southern participation, we uh, often don't realize that uh, uh, they are still a luxury uh, for many uh, in the South given that uh, many of uh, the universities even have been unable to afford uh, good, good virtual IT settings. And many of the universities in the South are located in areas with weak internet penetration, uh, something which again is, is a huge uh, cause of concern. And my last point I think which uh, comes to mind from your intervention is uh, one of the recent things which we heard at the launch of the UNDP's uh, Human Development Report this year, which is that in the development debates, uh, particularly those development debates which have an ideological underpinning, the South is almost uh, absent. Most of the ideological uh, development debates which are taking place are entirely being led by the North. So, so thank you very much. And this brings me uh, to our last uh, panelist. Uh, and we have with us uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nisha uh, Aruna Telaki, and uh, uh, she's going to talk about uh, uh, participation or access to uh, research funding. Uh, uh, Nisha is Director of Research at Institute of Policy Studies uh, of Sri Lanka. Uh, uh, over to you, Nisha. Thank you, Akka. As uh, Waka said, I am the Director of Research at the Institute of Policy Studies of Sri Lanka. So in my institute, uh, once in three years, we come up with a research program. But um, it's all, all, almost always we have funds to carry out the research we have identified. We try to raise funds through projects. Usually the projects come with their own research objectives and they don't always fit in with our research agenda. Um, we try to use own funds to conduct research that we think are very important, but often we don't have um, sufficient funds and we have to limit the scope of those projects because of funding limitations. Now, these are not experiences unique to IPS. These are experiences um, uh, encountered by all kinds of researchers and think tanks throughout the global south. There is increasingly agreement that researchers living in developing countries are better aware of the research gaps and are better able to set research agendas that have more value to development stakeholders. Local researchers are also closely associated with the policy policy stakeholders, making it easier for them to communicate research findings. Now, this um, nexus between research to policy is not a direct line. It's a complex set of activities, and you have to act in a lot of different ways and in the long term to make research, use research to influence policy. Now that can be done by somebody who is already in a country, in the locality where policy uh, changes need to happen. A lot of these um, um, outside researchers who come by for short duration of time, they even if they uh, produce good research, oftentimes they are not there to influence change using that research. But although it is important for local researchers to conduct research, the capacity of the local research to conduct research, as, as I mentioned earlier, is very limited. A recent PEP study um, assessing the participation of researchers from lower middle income countries in economic development policy debates, led by Lucas Ryan Corney, I was also um, involved in that study, 
we found that there are three main reasons for poor participation of local researchers in development policy reports. This is because lack of demand by funding agencies and governments, lack of access to networks, and lack of capacity of the local um, researchers. These were also what was um, highlighted by uh, my colleagues before me. So this is like a vicious cycle. There is low funding, which limits the access to resources and training, which limits the capacity of local researchers, which affects the quality of the research. So they are not invited to networks. And then there is no demand for work done by local researchers. So what we want um, to do in this call to action is change that research cycle by increasing funding for development research led by local researchers. This can include funding for training, funding for mentoring and scientific workshops, but also for research fellowships that can help to foster and protect the research time of young talented scholars residing in developing countries. We think that such kind of funding can create better quality research and um, involve better involvement of local researchers in development discussions and um, produce better skilled researchers and more vibrant research cultures in uh, developing countries better engagement of researchers in public debates and keep on key policy issues, and greater involvement of local researchers in research agenda setting that address the key concerns of the societies where they live in, which could also help development, reduce development disparities. Now, there is evidence uh, from 2009 to 2018, Maka also mentioned that because he was also part of the Think Planning Initiative and Institute of Policy Studies was also part of this initiative. There was an experiment where a um, lot of funders got together. It was managed by uh, ITRC and they provided co-funding to 43 think tanks in 20 uh, different countries in Asia, Africa, and Latin America over 10 years. One key learning from this initiative was that having access to co-funding enabled think tanks to develop their own research agendas, which were able to generate public debates in their societies and influence positive policy changes. Now, um, there a book by the uh, South Asian think tanks who benefited from this think tank initiative. Um, there's a book called Strengthening Policy Research, Role of Think Tank Initiative in Asia, South Asia. It's um, edited by um, Orat, Dick Sitma, and Verma, and, but all the um, resource persons from different think tanks contributed to this book. It very clearly explains that uh, the crucial role played by long-term core support in strengthening think tanks for more rigorous research quality and for a better influence, um, better capacity for researchers to influence public policy. And more importantly, it also shows how different think tanks take different and complex ways to influence policies in their respective domains, something which is very difficult for somebody who is coming from outside for short periods time to do. So this book recommends the need to strengthen think tanks and local researchers for facilitating evidence-informed and effective public policy making, which is also what we are calling for. Thank you. Uh, uh, very important uh, insights, and uh, thank you for also uh, mentioning the book, which is a huge uh, resource uh, for, for anyone who really wants to see uh, 10 years of uh, TTI experience, which was entirely directed towards uh, this sudden participation, which uh, we are uh, discussing uh, today. Uh, one of the things that I'm also reminded about is the role of uh, uh, development finance institutions here and the recent critique that institutions like 
the Asian Development Bank or the African Development Bank are also usually uh, led in their uh, thinking uh, by uh, Northern uh, resource uh, expertise, of course. Uh, one could understand if uh, operations or management requires Northern expertise, but if, when it comes to development thinking and their research units of uh, Asian Development Bank or African Development Bank, uh, those also uh, uh, seem to be dominated by uh, the Northern uh, resource uh, persons, if I may say. Uh, and uh, I think a uh, recent FCDO, which was formerly called DFID, uh, their innovation fund uh, meeting uh, has, has, uh, has, has uh, come in really hard on the country offices uh, for not taking a risk on public sector universities uh, in uh, the South and a lot of work which was supposed to be commissioned or ideas which had to be crowdsourced from these public sector universities. Uh, in the South uh, went to uh, consulting groups or uh, contractors uh, from uh, abroad. Uh, so I, I understand that we are really left with uh, uh, eight or nine minutes, but we have some very interesting questions that I want to turn to uh, just in the interest of time. I am going to take the liberty uh, to really uh, direct each of the questions to one of my uh, fellow, fellow uh, panelists. Uh, maybe in the reverse order, uh, I will let uh, Nisha take uh, the question by Philippe, which is around uh, what is the success rate for local researchers in accessing corporate data uh, or big data, which uh, I'm, I understand that he may be implying uh, may carry a fee or financial resources that are required to access this data. Uh, for uh, Ronel, if I can move to the next question, uh, which she may answer, that how effective uh, in your experience have been academic corporate partnerships uh, in research? Uh, I would also request uh, 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 our, our colleague Veronica to take uh, uh, John Coburn's uh, the question, what can Northern researchers who wish to increase Southern-led development do to help change the current situation in terms of funding networks, conferences, and publications? Uh, and of course, then there's a, the, 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 there's a comment which I would request uh, Anna and Lucas, maybe if uh, any of you would like to uh, take on from our colleague uh, Bawa, which is uh, around uh, uh, what progress do you see in developing countries for greater ownership of uh, their research in terms of uh, uh, much needed investment uh, and what steps should be taken to promote their ownership? So, so, so maybe uh, in the interest of time, maybe just one to two minutes to each so that we can really finish on time. Uh, Nisha? This is success rate for local scholars in accessing cooperate data. Um, uh, what are the most significant hurdles? So actually, I am not really aware of the success rate. I can talk about the significant hurdles. I think one main significant hurdle is that they don't know about the value of this uh, data because a lot of the researchers that I know, they are still learning to navigate the social media and the um, uh, using the, the information generated by web and social media for research. So they actually, um, they are still at that stage. So they are not even looking to use this data. And that's, um, that is the main, one of the main barriers. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, in terms of the effectiveness of academic co corporate partnerships, I think in research broadly, it can work very well as long as there's an alignment of interest. I think the difficulty is that when we talk about development research specifically, um, very often our um, interests are not entirely aligned uh, with a lot of um, uh, private sector companies. Um, but in my experience, when you do find the sweet spots, um, the places or the meeting points, the overlaps, uh, where they are an alignment of, of incentives, it can be a very fruitful 
an exciting uh, venture. Like for instance, M Health um, Innovation, um, there are exciting opportunities of that, but I think one must just be realistic. Often there's misalignment and need to be careful, set the boundaries up front, the rules and boundaries. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, Vakar. Yes, I, I agree that the funding is one of the main obstacles for Southern participation uh, it, because everything is related to funding, right? So technology today is very important. Internet, computer, um, co participation in conferences, travel grants, paying uh, to publishing journals, paying subscriptions fees. So everything depends on funding and it's very, very important. Uh, so what to do? It, mainly, we need partnerships to begin with. Uh, we, it, it's, it's not correct that most of the conference are in the Northern countries. Um, the great majority of papers uh, are from Northern researchers, and they are talking about uh, the Southern part of the continent. We are talking, they are talking about policies that influence us, they influence the, the Southern researchers. And as Lucas mentioned, um, we have knowledge that sometimes they don't. We live there, we, we, we are in contact with problems they need solutions and we are aware of it. And it's not easy to come and just say, oh, we should do this and that because institutions don't work well, because policies don't work well. So this knowledge is very important. We need to get together, at least in the beginning. So we have some funds from the Northern countries, but we have a voice. Thank you. Bakar, there is actually a new question by Abdullah Khalid. Apologize if I do did not pronounce your name properly. And, and I will I will I will try to tackle that question, which is an interesting one. He's asking, what will we recommend for very young researchers who want to get into the field? So and, and this is my very personal opinion. So on the one hand, I will say even if there are many obstacles when doing research from the developing world, since you are close to the truth and we are and our activities to try to search for the truth, that is very rewarding. That is very rewarding. So, so uh, 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 you, 
you you should know that you will that you will face many obstacles, but it but but stay in the south. That that's my personal opinion. On the other hand, try to try to participate in as many networks as possible. Apply to conferences because there is definitely much to learn from the north, from colleagues both in the north and in the south in many other countries. The risk of staying in the south is isolation. So try to get. To many, to as many networks as possible. Thank you. Thank you, Bakar. Um, well, just very quickly, uh, returning to what can Northern researchers do to change uh, this situation? I will focus on the on the networks. Uh, because it was uh, what I was talking in this webinar. Uh, I think it's crucial as the, at the personal level that they try to establish partnership, partnerships with Southern researchers working in the same topics and uh, to read that the work that, uh, that is uh, done in the South to cite the work uh, that is done in the South that is like a, at a personal level. And then we also have, an, and I think it's very important, uh, the institutional level, and there Northern institutions need to create the spaces to support and to, to build and, and support long-lasting uh, partnerships with Southern institutions and Southern researchers. So there are, are like two levels there, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Let me uh, now uh, bring this to an end. Uh, it has been a very engaging discussion, some very good questions. Let me first of all start by thanking a great panel and the effort which they have done, the effort that has gone into their research. Uh, and this conclusion is basically, uh, once again, a call to action. Uh, I think what we have concluded today is that we have been aware of the underrepresentation of Southern researchers in the development field for decades. Uh, but as you have heard today, the situation has not improved. And we really call for your help and support and collectively to move the needle on this issue to improve uh, the development work and the lives of people living in the South. Uh, so first uh, and foremost, we really invite you to sign and uh, share this, this call to action uh, by, by PEP and the wider Southern community. Second, we also ask you to use any influence that you or your organization may have to help redress the imbalance, uh, for example, as we heard today by asking development conferences, who else is invited as speaker, panelists, do they re represent the South and what's the regional focus? Uh, for example, also by using the hashtag which uh, uh, PEP community is now using, which is hashtag include local researchers on social media posts. Uh, and, and this is really to uh, invite attention about uh, uh, focusing on the South and, and how, for example, participation of those based in South is, is so important. You may have ideas of your own to increase Southern participation. And uh, uh, I think my colleagues at the PEP Secretariat uh, and the wider team of PEP research fellows are available to take forward and listen to your advice. Uh, and in the end, uh, let me uh, thank uh, uh, my colleague uh, Jenny for uh, really all the logistics support that you've provided, PEP's executive director, the scientific advisor, and all the colleagues at the PEP secretary for their continuous guidance. Uh, this brings this session to an end, and uh, we look forward to seeing uh, all of you in the next session under this theme. Uh, thank you very much for your time and attention today. Thank you so much, Rekha, for hosting this session. Uh, on behalf of PEF, I also thank our panelists, Lucas, Anna, Veronica, Ronell, and Nisha. I thank uh, everyone who's attended. Um, I'm really sorry that our Spanish interpretation did not work. Um, I really hope we'll be able to sort that out for our next event. And uh, thank you for, for joining us and spending some time with us today. And we'll see you soon. Goodbye.